out there and smash it. Yes. All right, get ready for you. Good luck. Hey, buddy, what's your name? My name is JJ. JJ, how old are you? I just turned seven. Just turned seven? Yeah. What made you want to audition on Australia's Got Talent? I just wanted to be able to make the whole, like, all of Australia laugh. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Mate, we've got an audience here who can't wait to see what you've got in store for us. OK. Stage is yours, my friend. Good luck. Thank you. Water molecules are sticky. They attract to each other, which is why water tends to flow together, fall as raindrops, and beat up on the surface of a leaf. This property is the result of cohesion. To understand cohesion, let's imagine we're recreating a water molecule. A water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Because of the molecule's arrangement and the electronegativity difference between the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atom, the molecule becomes polar. The oxygen atom has a negative charge while the hydrogen atoms have a positive charge. Since we all know opposites attract, the oxygen atom will stick to a nearby hydrogen atom. The result is a strong bond. Our project location is in the slums on the outskirts of Lima. In these areas, people have major water problems because they're not connected to Lima's water network. This is where our fog catchers come in. We use the fog that's available in Lima as an alternative water supply and collect the water from the air. We use this water for two purposes in the community, the drinking water needs and agriculture. With agriculture, we can grow fruits and vegetables and create an extra stream of income for the community. And this is the prototype we are testing since more than three years in Italy, in our lab. And we are using different materials, experimenting different shape and things. This is an example of water collection from the fog. This is a new mesh we we're starting to use at the moment much more efficient. Moreover, looking to nature, we have other sources of inspiration. The spider web is very efficient in water collection. Or this little insect that is living in the most arid place in our planet, in the Namib desert, it knows how to collect water from the air in the night. It survived there for centuries. Nature also is showing us how to optimize the collection of water. The lotus tree, a lot of leaves, sorry, and many other leaves and plants, they know how to do it. And this is called, technically, super hydrophobic surface. Surface that repels the water so you can collect it. It was so cool being backstage on Australia's Got Talent, hanging out with all those people who are just desperate to get on TV. <laughs> hey, Ricky Lee. <laughs> Current technologies that are available for water treatment uh, are associated with major drawbacks. For example, you use chlorine to disinfect your water. Everybody knows about chlorine, right? That disinfects water. But what uh, people don't know that sometimes you have compounds in your drinking water that could react with this chlorine and actually produce even more har harmful chemicals and we drink that. And it's also very dangerous for workers who are actually disinfecting this water to work with chlorine. So do you want to work with a poisonous gas or do you want to work with water? What we are doing, we are pretty much using water to treat water, right? We, when we apply very high voltage and we create plasma, we create lightning inside of the water, what we are pretty much doing is breaking this water molecule, which is H2O, into H and OH. And these radicals are very fast acting species. They pretty much attack everything that is in the bulk liquid and quickly recombine and not be, they're not active after a while. So 
all this happens in a nanosecond scale. I'm telling you today is the Warka water where every drop counts. And this is the story that goes back in to 2012 when I went to this wonderful country, Ethiopia. So I discovered this beauty. It was like traveling back in time to another age. You see how they live integrated with nature. At the same time also I discovered there is a, a need. And seeing with my eyes children and women collecting water from unsafe sources they share with animals and also transporting this heavy tank through, you know, for many kilometers every day without shoes. So I've been thinking what we can do with all the technology we have and the know-how to help this situation. And following statistics, 60% of the inhabitants of Ethiopia is in this situation, is in lack of safe water. And 15 liters will be enough, you know, for humans to survive. And they don't have even that. And there are places in our planet where today, in average, one person consumes 500 liters of water. We are from a small community in Limpopo, South Africa, and there's a lot of difficulties there. Growing up, it has been really hard for us. That place, it has a lot of poverty. Many places have no electricity, and most of the homes do not have running water. It is very difficult. The challenges these kids face, it's devastating. Many of our kids' parents have passed away. And they've got to look after their little siblings on their own. So to try and help those orphans and vulnerable children, we started a choir. Surface tension is a result of cohesion and is the measure of how difficult it is to break the surface of a liquid. We can observe the high surface tension of water by watching this mosquito step onto its surface, or this insect as it struggles to free itself from a droplet. Surface tension is also what causes a water droplet to take a spherical shape. Water is the most cohesive of all non-metallic liquids. Hello! Oh, 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 oh. Oh. They keep coming? Welcome! Hi. How are you? What's your group's name? We are Unbeatable. And where are you from? Uh, Mumbai, India. Oh. oh, wow. What's it like there? Tell us more about your, where you're from. Uh, life in Mumbai, it's like very hard. The life in slum, they don't get proper water. And everything, they like... <sighs> Sorry. No, it's okay. okay. So knowing the very difficult situations that these people are living in, it was that much more inspiring to us when we came with a solution to see that they grabbed it with both hands to make a change in their community. After the first few fog catchers were installed and properly working, the word in the community spread very rapidly. The greatest thing about the project for us was to see that when we presented the community with a solution, they grabbed it with both hands and started working full time on it to make it work. you were in Legally Blonde. So tell me, what do you call a really smart blonde? What? A golden retriever. Dead. Now that many research groups are working uh, on this technology, the technology has lots of potential and uh, because there's so many uh, design engineering issues with, with the technology, uh, nobody, nobody has scaled it up yet. We got an EPA grant to pretty much in four years get this technology from not nowhere to a pilot scale to be able to, for example, uh, supply water to a small town. So I have very good graduate students who are working on the development. And this record that's been reached not far from here in the Emirates, where 100 years ago it was a desert, there was no water, and people, they were nomads because they couldn't meet because no resources to share. In fact, this is the things that move me to find a solution to try to help. And inspiration come from many different sources, from nature, from biomimicry, but also from 
local tradition and ancient tradition, as well as from the, the Warka tree. The Warka tree is a huge tree, as you can see. It's a symbol in Ethiopia. It's a symbol for the community. It's where they gather together. It's where they do educational training, a meeting, and so on. But the tree is also providing oxygen. It's also providing food because it's a ficus tree. And they keep it because they need it. And the tree is very intelligent to use the people to, to be, you know, to, 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 to be safe from the deforestation, which is happening very fast. The world is frozen up for me. How is it going to be okay? When they join us, many of our kids have the weight of the world on their shoulders and to them, their problems feel insurmountable. For us, it's not easy to dream. So I didn't like to smile. But after joining the choir, I found my voice and it brought back the smile on my face. Today we're going to show you how to make indoor rain. This is a great experiment that teaches you a bit about the water cycle. You're going to need a jug of hot water, a vase, some ice and a bowl. Put the hot water into the vase and put the bowl on top. Let it sit for a couple of minutes and you'll see that the inside of the vase has misted up. Then put the ice into the bowl. The ice will change the temperature of the bowl's surface. And as the warm air inside the vase rises and meets the cold bowl, it will start to form larger water droplets. Almost everybody came together to start making a change and start solving this water problem that they have had for decades. We were really blown away with the work ethic sometimes. This varied from women coming in with babies on their back till 75 year old men who came in every day to make a difference. With a motivated workforce like this, the word gets out very quickly. So it didn't take long for people from outside of the community to come in, work with us and learn about this solution. As these droplets collect on the side of the vase, they will drop down, just like rain. The same thing happens in our atmosphere when warm air meets cold. Isn't that cool? I bet you never thought you'd be able to make rain inside. So cute! Guess what? What? I got a girlfriend. <laughs> but I think I'm going to have to dump her because there's someone here. Hi there, pussycat! <gasps> Ever dated an Australian? All societies are beginning to become more and more developed, and so that means more agriculture, more industry, and more contamination. And so these contaminants are getting into the water supplies, and eventually they're going to reach levels where we, we, we're going to reach that tipping point where, where something new has to be done, new technologies have to be introduced. So currently we're looking at the uh, use of plasma injection into liquid water for the purpose of uh, water purification. We are VN Medieval Dance Group. Our group consists of 28 dancers aged 12 to 27 and we are from Mumbai, India. Many of the members of our group live in slums. The slums are very crowded, very dirty and they don't get proper electricity. Often 7 to 10 people are staying in one room. It is very challenging to survive over there. Each day we pray for a better life but in the slums, there is very little opportunity for us. So we provide them with all the knowledge they need, and then we show them all the different aspects that fog farming has. It is really important to teach and inform them well about the technical parts of these fog nets. One of the key factors of success for our project is that the community knows well how to install these fog nets and how to maintain them. This is, of course, so that the community can be completely self-sustaining in their water needs by using the fog nets. After a short period of training, they know how to install these fog nets themselves. And in this way, they can teach other people and other communities about this solution and what it can do for them. So we researched in Ethiopia where first to install it because we had the chance finally to realize a prototype in Africa. 
So it's different locations that we select following the meteorological you know, uh, situation, but also the need. Where need? The need was in, uh, in this rural country. And we found this village, Dorze, and we started from there. So you see, this is the community. This is me in the middle of them. And when I arrived there, they were wondering what this guy wants to do here. Why is he here? It's a very remote place. It's 2,400 meters above the sea level, very far away. So I started telling them about the work idea. So they were skeptical. They say, OK, we don't understand very well what you want, but let's do it. You can do it! Being in the choir, it just gave me a sense of belonging and confidence to not be afraid that it's okay to dream. So yes. you just know the sky is the limit. Exactly. That's why now we want to show the whole world that anything is possible. They come from one of the poorest communities in the world. Yet these kids manage to lift themselves up. To see them standing on the stage of America's Got Talent tonight. I just... And the amount of water that we can catch here is incredible. As soon as the fall comes in, the water pipes are dripping full. In this area, with the right circumstances, we're able to collect between 300 and 400 liters a day per net. It is so incredible for us to see that a solution so simple can have such a big impact on people's lives. When we dance, we forget all the tensions in our mind. And we feel free. For the past two weeks, we are not able to sleep. This opportunity could change our life and everyone wants to succeed to give back to the families. We used to see the America's Got Talent on YouTube. We were like, can we go here? Like, someday. We were just dreaming about it. And today we are here. I can't explain it in words. It's our dream come true. But Warka Water is not only a device for collecting water. It's actually the ambition, desire. This is one function. But it's also a social place, a place where people underneath can, can gather. We can create you know, educational training workshops so children can learn about resources, about many things. And this we can organize with them. But at the same time, it is also providing an economy because people that will make it, people that will live out of it rather than transporting water, they can spend time making, assembling, maintaining it. Nini! My mum loves watching you on MasterChef. <laughs> a bit of a style tip. You look so much better without the cravat. <laughs> Our whole water treatment infrastructure is based on the way the world was, say, 100 years ago. Conventional water treatment system, literally, it consists of a series of filters and then a, um, a disinfection stage. Disinfection stage includes uh, ozone as well as uh, injection of chlorine. That's it. There's no additional chemistry that goes into your conventional plant to remove organic contaminants like pesticides, pharmaceuticals. Those small molecules just pass straight through. The nice thing about plasmas is that you have this fourth state of matter, matter it's glowing gas, you inject it into the water, it produces ozone, UV light, and all these reactive radicals. And in this way, the uh, plasma can initiate the uh, purification of the water by simply attacking whatever organic contaminants that are in the water. And that includes uh, things like pesticides, pharmaceuticals, um, and uh, bacteria and viral particles as well. In my mind, start to create what is today the, the work of water. And the objective with it was to do something easy to be used, that it doesn't create any damage to the landscape, and also that can be made locally, can create every day 100 liters of water, potable water, and cost less than $1,000. So this was the objective. And now let's see the development of the, of the project. So, since three years, we are working on the Warka water, and this is the, the different version up to the fifth one, fifth one we have developed so far. Stumbling blocks still remains throughput, though. In other words, 
these, these devices tend to be small, and so process volumes are also small. And so when we're looking at um, alternative ways to make plasma in much larger volumes. When we first started this uh, research, we had envisioned it for a uh, point of use treatment system, particularly for underdeveloped countries. So you can envision this being at the center of a village where, where people bring their water to it to be processed and that would be all solar powered. As far as developed countries, particularly conventional water treatment systems here in the United States, you can imagine having a stage where you have plasma producing electrodes injected in line to produce plasma to that flowing water. So it would be in line, it would be an, an additional stage that takes care of the contaminants that we aren't addressing right now. I know, I know, I should respect my elders. You've been a cooking judge for 10 years now, eating nothing but panna cotta, beef cheeks. So it got me thinking, what's your excuse, Shane? <laughs> So we start to make it. I've been there teaching them and showing them how I intend to construct the tower, which is done with mainly three materials, bamboo, let's say natural fiber wire, and the polyester mesh. And the tools we have been using were always very simple because we know in Africa, in a rural situation, there is nothing. But we learn how to do almost everything out of one tool. They teach us, which is this one they use in this place. And you see from the movie how they split the bamboo in a very simple way with the ends. So this is what they do since they are, you know, babies. So here we started working together, the collaboration, in order to, to build the work. And it was very exciting, an amazing experience. It took us more or less two months before, you know, we managed to, to, to realize it. And also we have been looking to local tradition, like they have these incredible skills to build cables, ropes out of natural fiber. I discovered it, I didn't know, that from the banana tree, they took a part of the trunk, they took with the bamboo tools the pulp out of it, as you can see, the lab is doing. They eat it because they bake it, and what is left, the fibers they use for the, for, the, for the wires. So there is no waste, there is nothing that is no, left over, everything is recycled. Who's next? I'm gonna guess a choir. Yeah, we love choirs. I know. Hi, guys. What is the name of this group? Our name is the Nklovo Youth Choir, and we're all the way from uh, Limpopo in South Africa. Oh, you're from South Africa. Wow. Uh, my name's Ralph Schmitz, I'm the conductor. You're the conductor. How long have yeah. you been doing it? Uh, we've been together for 10 years. Hi, hi. Hi, what's your name? My name is Sandy Limachola. Is this your first time in America? Yes, this is my first time in America. Hello, America! And what does this mean to you? This is a dream come true, it's like I'm dreaming right now. And they are great weaver. They weave everything from, you know, the dress they, they wear to the, the buildings. You see, the, the fence is done with local bamboo, split it and weaved. You see, the beauty of the human made and nature is absolutely well integrated, as well as the houses. You see how they, they look in the landscape. And those houses are biodegradable. Once finished, they will disappear. So it's very important to have a, a, a safe and clean drinking uh, water and the water we drink today contains uh, high concentrations of regulated and unre unregulated contaminants which would have adverse effect on human uh, health. The need for technologies to remove uh, these contaminants like PCB and pharmaceuticals even from our water supplies is important. Something needs to be done. and. Um, uh, our, our future essentially depends on it. Can you tell me the song? Is it original? What's it about? So the song that we're going to sing for you today is called My African Dream. Couldn't be more perfect for today because 
It expresses hopes and dreams. And uh, our dream is to let children around the world know that just because you're born in poverty, it doesn't mean that you are poverty. Wow, that's beautiful. All right, well, that's pretty exciting. You've come all the way from South Africa, and you are now on the biggest talent stage in the world. So I can't wait to hear what it is you do. Oh, cool, thank you. And today I will talk to you about the, the number three, which we just finished to install in Ethiopia. Warkawot is basically a tower, 10 meter high, that is constructed in modules. So the modules from the ground are mounted one on top of the other. So there is no need of scaffolding, no need of electrical tools. All is made with the collaboration of the, of the people. And what it does, it collects water from the rain when it rains, or fog, when there is fog in the atmosphere, or high humidity. But without rain and without fog, by condensation, which happen by different in temperature from night to day. Say, okay, we do it. Let's give us the chance to, to show you. So we did. And it was a big event. All the community was there. It was a lot of tension. So we start doing it with um, them help. And in less than 20 minutes, we put it up 10 meters of the Warka water, and they were very surprised. So they've been, at the beginning, like, you know, speechless. And then, suddenly, when the installation was complete, I went to the, to the chief of the village, which is a very old person. I went there, and I told him, with all the respect, well, this is what I promise you to, to bring here. It's an experiment, and we want to test it here in your village. Do you let me do so, can we test it for the next month? And this guy that you can see here, that is uh, very well respected, he didn't say one word, but looking to the others, they started to, to, to do that. So, not one word, but they express the happiness with dance and with joy. So we have been dancing the entire day up to the night. It was an incredible party all around the Warka. Well, of course, we're made up mostly of water and we have oceans of water around us and it kind of, you know, water's kind of a boring topic to many people, but when you really study water, how soluble it is, how it can fit any container, how um, the energy of water, uh, you know, and in, in when it's in crystal form from ice, uh, how it resonates different frequencies. Um, it's a really, it's probably the most magical thing on our planet and we take it for granted. I'm uh, very careful of the water I put in my body. I go to a natural spring and we go and we fill up our five gallon jugs once a week and we make sure we you know, eat. Uh, we use that water with everything. And uh, I, I notice a major difference in how I feel by the water I'm drinking, the, just the water alone. And in future we are planning for the new version to create also food, an edible garden, which already we started with some of the water produced by, by the Warka water. And also we are planning to, to introduce power, energy, so illuminate this area under the canopy, so children in the night, after the sunset, they can study and maybe do more with the, with the possibility to have power. Behind the project, there is a long research in different fields, for sure how the, you know, the water system cycle works in our planet. We have to think that we have river of water above our head. It's up to us to catch this water and bring down to, to us and to use it. Really, the truth, which is that we are water. Each and every one of us is water. It is our most abundant substance. And yet, we don't notice it. It's so entwined in us, we just forget that it's even there. We look at water in the outside world, we see a glass, we see a river, we see an ocean, we say water. But how often do we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, water? I said, empty your mind. 
be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Violet is the first person to have studied the existence of galactic superwaves and basically looking at evidence that through different historical epochs there have been these great concentrations of cosmic rays impacting the earth and Dr. La Violet had an extraordinary theory for the existence of pulsars. He believed that these were artificially created by advanced extraterrestrial civilizations as warning beacons to newer civilizations such as ours about the existence of these galactic superwaves. And he basically looked at a number of pulsars pointing towards the Earth and the frequencies that they were transmitting at and saying that this was evidence that these pulsars are transmitting a warning to the Earth to be ready for the next galactic superwave, which if we're not ready, could actually wipe out our civilization. Within these secret programs, scientists have become aware of what they're calling a galactic superwave. This wave is traveling through our galaxy and has multiple layers. They describe it as being a giant dust cloud, but with different energetic variables. What they had figured out is they had flown a craft out to these locations, and when they did, the energy had a very strange effect on the consciousness of the inhabitants of those craft. People who were positive would bliss out, and people who had more of a negative vibe would become more so. And they described this as an end time madness that is carried through this wave that travels through each solar system. And when it does, the leading edge acts as sort of a Christ consciousness that forces people to judge themselves and to deal with their own karma and traumas or experience in time madness. So the stars actually represent a clock. The stars are telling us when the end of the cycle will occur. And these historians discovered that 35 cultures around the world were clocking this procession they had all this numerical information about the procession encoded in their myths, and they said it appears that some singular source worldwide programmed these mythologies, encoded this information into them. Well, this would be what we would call the angelic groups or the positive extraterrestrials, what the secret space program people call the genetic farmer race. They knew that at the end of the cycle that we are going to go through this process. There's an unnatural and global epidemic currently spreading around the world. 
By now, you probably heard about something called the coronavirus. But what is it exactly? How and where did it originate? Did this virus really spread from a seafood market in China? Or is there more to this story that's hidden in plain sight? How is China controlling this epidemic now? And did you know that they are using strict wartime disciplines to control its citizens? To understand the big picture, we need to dig deep into history, connections, and expose certain figures and groups. In an age where information is suppressed and controlled, and a global epidemic is rampant, we need to ask these questions. What is the coronavirus actually made up of, and how does it function? When and from where did it really originate? Is there a bigger story, one that's not being reported, or at least not being reported correctly and accurately? And if there is, who was involved? Did you know that just eight miles from the epicenter of the outbreak lies a biosafety laboratory housing other viruses? What else could the Chinese government be hiding from the world? And why is the media downplaying such an important issue? What are the people of China and in other parts of the world saying about the coronavirus? And is there already a cure? Or is this just a distraction? What else could the Chinese government be covering up? Be informed on this and more on our special report 2019 NCOV Coronavirus. Only on the edge of wonder.